Hey, thank you very much. And uh, by the way, along the way, we, uh, through an endowment I was a part of, did help uh, start the Mars Society on its path. And uh, uh, Bob and uh, those of you working on the uh, organization have done a fantastic job. So I had an amazing PowerPoint. It was incredible. I mean, music, dancing elephants, all kinds of things. And I crashed it about 30 minutes ago. So I'm going to uh, basically freestyle with you a little bit about some, some basic points I want to get across. First, a couple of little commercials. One, um, I do want to mention Space Fund. We are a venture capital firm. Uh, we invest in frontier technologies, uh, those sorts of technologies that will enable or profit from the revolution that's going on right now that we call new space and, and the work of, of people like Brother Elon, who's coming on later, and, uh, and Jeff and uh, other folks. Um, we just closed our first fund um, and we're investing. We were investing in, um, again, these sorts of frontier technologies um, and, uh, uh, you know, Axiom, a uh, little company called SpaceX got a couple of bucks from us and uh, uh, Orbit Fab, which is doing propellant transfer, uh, several others. Um, if you're interested and you're an accredited investor, please get in touch with me. We've just opened our second fund and uh, it, it's going to be even more exciting and uh, it'll be a $20 million fund. Uh, so yeah, definitely do that uh, and uh, reach out to myself and my amazing partner. Uh, Megan Crawford. Um, so here's what I'm going to talk about. How we make this happen. And I don't mean how we make this happen the way that uh, most of the other speakers have been talking about it, like the technology of making it happen or how we're going to grow rutabagas on Mars or how we're going to, uh, you know, uh, recycle air and, and water and these sorts of things. Um, because we've done that. In fact, we're doing it all the time. We're doing it over and over and over again. I've watched probably three or four cycles of this happen um, since uh, I was old enough to pay attention. Uh, in other words, once I graduated college and completely sobered up. Um, I've seen it happen over and over again. We are reinventing the wheel every few years. We are recalculating, redeciding, re-initiating uh, uh, these movements, be it the L5 Society, which um, I had the bumper sticker, was going to build colonies at L5 based on Dr. O'Neill's concepts by 1995. Um, my own Space Frontier Foundation, we started in 1988. Um, I go back and I read some of my writings and I have to admit, uh, I, I hit some things dead on, but I was terribly wrong on, on others in terms of the timelines involved. Um, and that is happening over and over again. And we, we've got to break out of that cycle. I think, technologically speaking, we may be about to. Um, but there's some real problems with, with what's happening here. So I, I wanted to get a little bit, uh, God forbid, realistic on some of this stuff. Um, let's look at what 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 we have, the choices we have. Okay, we've, we've got the moon, we've got Leo, we've got what I call free space, which is the place between worlds, uh, and we've got Mars. Now, one of the things that I've seriously uh, engaged in and, and had to learn now that I am uh, a uh, serious businessman and, and involved in uh, uh, you know, for-profit operations, uh, things like that, is that nobody stays until somebody pays. Nobody stays until somebody pays. Now, that could be taxpayers uh, or it could be customers. Um, there has to be something that is seen as profit wherever you're going. Now, profit can be defined in many different ways. So, for example, um, we can see profit in the obvious way, which is financial return. We can see profit in terms of nations, in terms of uh, strategic capabilities, in other words, the high ground, um, prestige, hey, we've got a space program, um, or uh, inspiration, watch your people flying into space and you'll be inspired to go to school and study hard because we need lots of engineers. 
those are, that's the profit on a national level. There are um, other forms of profit, of course, and, and for example, science. We can learn about ourselves. We can learn about the past and future of this planet and the solar system itself. And that is a, a serious profit. And then there are other kinds of profits. The kinds of profits that sometimes come from prophets with a P-H-E-T-S spelling. The kind of profits that are more indefinable, let's say, and yet just as powerful and always overlooked when people are doing spreadsheets and bottom lines. Now, low Earth orbit offers us all of that list. It's strategic, it's the high ground. It is capable of producing physical goods services. We can use it as a place to string telephone cables and, uh, in other words, bounce signals to space and back down to the Earth. We can study the Earth from there. We can do all of these different things. We can open hotels. I signed up the first uh, citizen to buy a ticket to the space station, and, and we can do these kinds of things going on into the future. All of these capabilities we can get in low Earth orbit. We get out to the moon, it gets a little bit less. It, it's a little bit harder to define the financial profit, which is one reason so many companies have tried and failed to do things. I was part of a company called Lunacorp. My friend uh, Peter Diamandis was, uh, had a company called Blastoff in the 90s. Both companies failed. Um, and uh, because we couldn't put that equation together, cheap transportation, things like that, tied in with how we were going to make money. Um, but there's still those other reasons for going to the moon. Um, now, part of it on a macro strategic level, I, I do a little consulting here and there with an organization called Space Force, and we talk about the idea of the strategic high ground in terms of the solar system, um, which is a reason you're seeing Chinese and, and U.S. interests, for example, in the poles of the moon, where we discovered uh, water. Um, I won't get into all of these details again because I think you're a fairly sophisticated audience. Uh, you already know a lot of this stuff. So I'll kind of shorthand my way through some of these things. But the fact is that the moon offers us a little bit less. Yes, you may have the, uh, the great hotel, um, you know, with the view of the earth, um, uh, you know, no atmosphere, but great view, right? Um, you can have all of these other sorts of activities going on. Uh, on the moon that can begin to return uh, profits. You could also see the moon as a destination for settlement. Although really, I believe the moon is, there are gonna be people that live on the moon. I mean, heck, there are people who live everywhere, right? I mean, there are people, no matter where you go on the earth, somebody's gonna figure out a reason, a rationale, and a way to live there. So there will be people who live on Mars, I mean, excuse me, on the moon. But I don't think it's going to be the massive uh, draw, the, 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 the main place that human beings go. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, and I think a couple of them are actually very simple and very basic, so basic we might overlook them. And, uh, you know, for example, Mars doesn't have, uh, the moon doesn't have a sky. The moon doesn't give us that same sort of psychological comfort that for millions of years as human beings where we have uh, been basically uh, genetically evolved to work on a plane with a sky, it's not as comfortable. And yes, even though as the previous speaker pointed out correctly that we will probably be living under Mars rather than on it, um, it's still got a sky. It still looks like, heck, it looks like parts of Arizona. I mean, it looks like parts of West Texas, where I live. Um, so it's familiar. Um, and so the moon itself will probably be, there'll be industrial capabilities on the moon. There will be scientific capabilities on the moon. There will probably be a monastery over on the far side. There will be places where we practice and learn how to operate on the surfaces of other vacuum uh, worlds that are in vacuum and bathed in radiation. But as far as a, the place to go, maybe not. Now Mars, on the other hand, is interesting in a couple of ways. One, 
there is no current thing that I can think of and anybody else I know that's credible can think of that is going to be able to return large financial profits from Mars. There just isn't. Some people, you know, there was the, the guy who was going to do a TV series, a reality show, um, and then we're gonna, somehow that was going to pay the billions of dollars to go to Mars. Eh, not going to work. The, uh, the idea that maybe IP, people who are going to have to develop all the technologies necessary to live and survive on a world like Mars, could sell that IP back to an Earth that is working on uh, recovering um, um, from the planetary devastation that we've created here. <clears throat> Why? Same people, um, uh, because there are people closer in, like the moon, they're going to be doing the same thing. Uh, people in space stations and free space, they're going to be doing the same things in a way. Uh, and also, by the way, you're not going to go on a three-month voyage, which is basically going to be a one-way trip, to live on Mars so you can there figure out how you're going to survive. All right? Yes, you will learn new uses for duct tape and, uh, you know, the other things you have with you when you're on Mars. But you are not necessarily going to be creating the major breakthroughs necessary to live in a closed life support system in an alien world or in, in, a, in the deserts of the earth or whatever, you'll get better at it, but you better have that figured out before you get there. In fact, Mars may be a net importer of technology in, the, in its early days. So those standard bottom line Wall Street type kinds of uh, profits are maybe not necessarily gonna be available uh, when we go to Mars. So, how will we pay for this? How, how are you going to get there? Look, I'm gonna take a little diversion here for a second. I, I, Bob and I, and many of the people on these panels that are speaking to you today, uh, we speak at a lot of conferences. Um, if you're like many of us, you go to a lot of conferences. Um, and you've been going to a lot of conferences and we've been speaking at a lot of conferences and we've been holding a lot of conferences for many, many years. And guess what? Nobody at those conferences, nobody on those panels, standing on those po or behind those podiums, speaking to you at any of these events is any closer to Mars or the moon or the asteroids or any of these places than when we started doing it sometimes decades ago. So the challenge before us right now, given one assumption, and it's a huge assumption, and, uh, and you can ask him about it when he speaks later today. This one assumption is that we've got this guy, maybe two, maybe there's somebody we don't know about. We this guy, one person on this planet who has dedicated his life, the profits he made by selling a little company uh, called PayPal or whatever, to getting us off this rock and expanding humanity and life into the solar system. One guy. Our entire bet, but we're really lucky because this guy has done a heck of a job and his team, his company led by the way, by a woman, Gwen Shotwell, who's an amazing person. So you have this organization led by this one guy and they're going to provide the technologies for you to go to Mars. They're going to open the solar system for all of us. Now, here's the question. Will you be able to go? Will you be able to afford to go? Probably not. Probably not. You can afford to go to the conferences. You can afford to go to these events. You can buy swag. You can do all of these other things. You can hang out with us and talk about it. But will you be able to afford to go? And even more importantly, Will you and people like yourself be able to go to Mars and build that place you want to build? Those communities, the, the, we were just seeing some of the pictures of the, the SpaceX designs, and I know you're seeing other designs for communities and amazing habitats and ways of living on Mars. Will you be able to afford it? Will you and your 20 best space fan friends be able to afford it? No, you won't. Sure, the cost is going to drop, but is it going to drop to those levels? And even if it drops to a certain level, 
you're going to go to Mars and how are you going to pay for all of this as far as your resupply, your construction, your building, your ability to not just get there and survive, but thrive. How are you going to do it? It's an interesting question when you really think about it. How do you transform from an advocate, a supporter, a fan, a believer into somebody who can actually go? And this is the critical point I want to get across today, if nothing else. We have to start now. It is time to begin to transform this space community, the space advocacy groups, the, the organizations, into entities that are building to go, that are planning to go. It is time now if you are going to financially intersect the capability to be able to go. In other words, let's say Elon can get the Starship flying at a level where you could go to and from Mars by the end of this decade. I know he says sooner, I love Elon, but I've been around a lot of engineers. So uh, even, even the best have a tendency to be a little optimistic as do we all. But let's say 2030. You need to begin to organize now, to begin putting in place the financial tools now, to begin creating the social structures now. In other words, and forgive any uh, un-PC things I might say, if you know me, you know I occasionally do that, but let's say you wanted to form the pilgrims to be able to take the Mayflower and go to the new world. Well, you need to start now. You need to either start putting together the, most people don't realize this, there was actually a corporation, a Massachusetts Bay Company that had both pilgrims, true believers and outside investors as a part of it, and start putting that together now so that your financial wherewithal intersects in 10 years with the capability of going. Or you need to start a church and do the same thing. A private financial institution, a public financial institution, or a religious institution. And you need to start thinking about how that can come together based on what we have. What we have is a diverse group of people all around the world who are fans, who are advocates. We are armchair advocates in many cases. We do token uh, work on this. You know, once a year, different groups get together and they all go visit Washington. And I've done it. It's very empowering. You should absolutely support these sorts of activities. But it's time to get hardcore. It's time to get really, really serious. And I'll say something right now, completely on PC, but you need to see through the example I'm using to understand what I'm trying to get to you or get across to you. QAnon. These people are, excuse my language, batshit crazy. But look what they've done. They've gone from nothing to running, I think there's more than a hundred QAnon quote unquote believers running for Congress right now. They're all over the place. A terrible example, I know, but at least it'll strike a chord with you. Why can't we in the space community, where we have logic and science and reasonable people with some credibility, myself excluded, why can't we as a community begin to organize in that manner? Why are we waiting? Why do we go to these conferences and sit back and, and suck in all of this material and all of these amazing, amazing projections and ideas and then sit back and wait for somebody else to make it happen? We talk about it's for our children. Well, it was for our children 30 years ago, and now it's for the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. It's like fusion, right? It's only 10 years away, or as some might say, space solar power. You know, it's only 10 years away. It's time to shift what we are doing. And I'm going to call out to you 
as the members of the Mars Society, because you are one of the more effective organizations. And, and while Bob and I back in the old days used to butt heads quite often, you could go by the bars and the hotels where we were and hear us yelling at each other at two in the morning. We're on the same side now. And I believe the technological side of this, by the way, I don't want to say it's settled, but I think the core concepts of how to do it have been laid out. And there's two elements of what I'm going to say next. One is we have to begin to, to coalesce. And two, we have to begin to support each other. And so I'm going to say right now, right here, that I think Bob's idea, his direct, Moon Direct, Mars Direct, even though he kicked me out of the Mars Society in its early days because I dared talk about the moon, that was for you, Bob. The fact is, his ideas are the way to do this. This is how to do it. I think Elon has bought into it. I think this is the way to do it. Pre-positioning supplies, robotic, precursor missions, followed by human beings coming into a, a basically partially assembled situation, using ISRU, living off the land, etc. Perfect. That's handled. Now let's talk about how we finance it. Let's talk about how we organize to make sure that we can do it. Let's politically organize more than we are now. Again, not just once a week. We can't be armchair astronauts. We can't be armchair advocates. We have to stand up. We are going to take such a hit after this election next year as the bill for COVID comes due. It's quite possible Artemis will be gone. It's quite possible many, many of the other things that we're looking at are gonna be gone. So we have to think about what it is we want at the end of the day. We want a place where we can go to begin to build the next level of human civilization. Yeah, it'd be great if it has a sky. <laughs> I like skies. But we have to think now about how we are going to get under that Martian sky. And we have to do it in a way that is sophisticated and intelligent, uses the tools that are possible for us to use. We have to enroll the next generation. We have to be inclusive to bring in those, those parts of our culture, those people in our culture who have been left out. I did an article recently where I discovered that basically most boards of directors, most aerospace companies have perhaps one woman, one uh, minority underrepresented culture in their, in their boards of directors. We need to bring those people in and we need to organize. We need to go into the space agencies and tell them that the goal of their human space flight programs is the human development and settlement of space, period. And we need to stay on them until they agree. And then once we have that leverage, that top cover, that support, air support, let's say, now we can point at that rule and say, look, your job is to help us develop and settle space. That's your job. It's right here. It's in black and white. Congress said so. The parliament said so. It's right here. Now, how are you going to do that, Mr. Government Employee, Mr. NASA person, Mr. Space Force person, whoever it is? How are you going to enable me, the taxpayer, to realize what my dream is, which is to open this new frontier? Five minutes. So that's our job. Politically organizing and getting in there and making this stuff happen. We have to go in and stand up for things that are absolutely idiotically crazy insane that our own governments are doing in the name of our Shanghai vision and in the name of our vision that has been stolen away from us. Like the SLS, the Senate launch system must be canceled. Gateway, get rid of it. We need to do things that, we need to cause our government to do things that support our vision. So that's, that's the key. Organizing at a level where you are absolutely taking the stand that this is my life. Organizing your life at a level that Elon or Bob Zubrin or perhaps myself and others do, that we are dedicated to making this happen, not playing at space. 
That's the future we have to have. We have to create philosophies around that. We have to create an understanding of who we are. Yeah, I'd love to see little Mars on Earth starting to pop up out in the deserts around the world of people who are committed to eventually going to Mars. We should organize our investments. We should start tithing. I think Bob talked about this a few years ago as well. Start tithing. Take the money you would spend on going to the conferences or, or an additional amount if you still want to come to the conferences. Put them into accounts and start investing as an organization. Creating trusts and investment funds that are highly profitable. Managed not by you because you have stars in your eyes, but by professionals who are out to make you a lot of money. And then figure out how to make down payments. And in three or four years, perhaps show up at SpaceX and say, here's the down payment from my group. You know, my group, uh, maybe we're all fans of risk and only people who are fans of risk are gonna come and live in our colony on Mars. And then, you know, the people who like chess can go over there or whatever it is. And we're putting a down payment on. Now, by the way, you're giving him a market and you're beginning to create the reality. Here's the money to pay for the pre-launch, the, the pre-positioning, the building of what will become our settlement in uh, five years of resupply. You see the profit of Mars is hope. The profit of space overall is that it is a frontier and a place that we can go to, to take the next steps. Along that line, I'll offer you one last thing here as I close out. And this will be in the book I'm working on. It's the Space Manifesto. And by the way, you can follow me at, at Rocket Rick. But coming from this is what I call the principles of purpose. And there are three of them. Very simple. I'll break it all down for you some other time. But I believe that we are here for a purpose. Humanity is here for a purpose. And it's more important than all the other stuff we talk about and how much swag we have, where we live, whatever it is, you know, our latest TikTok videos, it's, it's more important than any of that. The three purposes of humanity are A, to protect and expand the domain of life. B, to expand and evolve human civilization. And C, to explore and experience everything in the universe. It sounds really simple, but it is those simple things that can be very powerful. And if you look at those three things, expanding the domain of life, One evolving minute. the human civilization, and experiencing everything in the universe, what a world it would be. What a civilization we might have if we woke up in the morning and these were the goals of living. So look, it's time. It's time to go to the next phase. It's time for the Mars Society to turn into Mars Society point two. 2.0, whatever term you want to use. It's time for us to organize, get real, and get off this planet. Thank you. Rick, I want to just thank you for your talk. Um, this is James Burke. I worked with you on the Lunar Development Conference, and it's always good to see you. Um, yeah, dude, and, and I want to highlight you and uh, the rest of uh, your team. Um, you're tireless, and um, I was part of that moon conference. I'm glad you guys kicked that back into gear. Uh, but you guys, um, you know, whatever I'm saying about our events, <laughs> don't go to our conferences, invest in Mars. <laughs> Um, it is critical that we have these gatherings, you know, it is that we do have the church of space, you know, we, it's a movable church. Uh, we, we gather, we, we believe in things we can't prove, um, that somehow are up there. Uh, we hang out, uh, with high priests who stand up on stage and tell us why we have to go. We speak a language that most of our friends can not understand. Uh, the only part we're missing is the financial power of most churches. So it's time to engage. So. I can tell you that right now, um, we have the biggest audience watching you that the Mars Society's ever had on the internet. So thank you for being part of this and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you, on, we'll see you up on the moon and Mars. Thank you, Bob. Good.